So a few weeks ago, Simone Yetch, the queen of shitty robots here on YouTube, made a video talking about the Yetch store, which is her online e-commerce channel, and talking about the challenges that she was having within it about having it scale up and hit profitability. And starting a company is really hard, so I feel for that. But there were a few things that she brought up that I thought actually could probably be solved with 3D printing. So we went ahead and just kind of made a demo and are gonna talk about it a little bit more here today. So if you haven't seen Simone's video, I recommend going over and checking it out. She walks through the challenges of being a YouTuber and trying to break into product and create a product-based store in order to create redundancy for your income streams. Because YouTube be fickle gods. And sometimes your videos get lots of views and sometimes they don't. So having a secondary source of income is really important in order to be sustainable on YouTube and in life itself. I mean, once I get old and this beautiful face just withers away, you guys aren't gonna keep on watching these 3D printing tips. So it's important for us to find other ways of making these channels viable. And for Simone, that's been the Yetch store where she has been able to produce a number of different products that are really nifty within brand and that she can sell to people who view her channel. And over time, build out the store as a retail channel that has its own brand and identity, ideally independent of the YouTube channel. But within that, she's run into all kinds of challenges. And most of those challenges have come around her clothes hanger, which is a custom designed invention that she created in order to allow shirts to be hung up against the wall if there's not enough room on a traditional like coat hanger. Throughout the video, she spoke about a number of the challenges with that. Everything from R&D cost being a large cost driver of monthly expenses, all the way up to having to store the stuff in a warehouse if you don't sell it all. And we're gonna go ahead and break down each one of those because we think it's something that actually 3D printing could probably solve for her depending on what she wants to get done. So let's go ahead and start with R&D first, and then we'll get into the production a little bit down the line. But with R&D being such a big expense, it's largely due to how long it takes to create the products. When you're creating a product to be manufactured, injection molded, machined, so on and so forth, there are a lot of rules that have to be followed and a lot of expertise that has to be used in order to get those created. That expertise is very expensive, and there's not really a way to prototype at home Whereas with like 3D printing, you're able to prototype on your printer, and then yes, there's some translation into production and some optimization that has to occur, but you can generally go fairly quickly from a home printer to production 3D print farms like ours. With R&D, with traditional manufacturing, there's not. You design it in CAD, and then you send it to the manufacturer and say, can you make this, what will it cost? And they say, it'll cost 50 bucks for that. And then you make a little tweak, and they're like, oh, now it's 10 bucks, that kind of a thing. So it's a very slow process, and you have to kind of know the end result without being able to iterate to that end result because it's just really expensive. Additionally, Simone talked about the fact that with these manufacturers, in order to get something made, you have to commit to a large volume, which means you're now spending a whole bunch of money to get stock in, and you don't necessarily know if that stock will sell. In her video, Simone talked about having to do pre-orders for the clothes hanger because they have to know how many they need in order to be ordered. So they can talk to their manufacturer and say, 10,000 people pre-ordered it, we need to buy 10,000 of those things. Or two people pre-ordered ordered it, we need to buy two of those things. They can match their volume and their request to the amount of demand that exists, and they know that the cash will be there, as opposed to buying a whole bunch of stuff, storing it, and then hoping somebody buys it eventually. That's a really expensive way to run product. So they're doing it the right way over there in order to make sure that they don't go broke or take a bet on something that people don't necessarily want. And this has always been the challenge with new products. If you were getting a mold or getting machined parts, you have to buy the mold and then you have to get all those machined parts. And in order to make them cost effective, you have MOQs, minimum order quantities, that you have to order in order to get the price down to where it's economical for your buyers. And this is something that Simone is coming up against too. Her clothes hangers as currently designed are quite expensive. You can buy a set of them where they're about $10 per hanger, but they're really well made. They're a nice steel rod and then they have the hinge on the in-between. So there's extra functionality from just a little wire hanger that you would get at a normal spot. So they're a good product, but they are also a premium product. And that's partially due to the volumes that they have to deal with. If they could scale it way up, then it, any part that is scaled way up generally reduces down near to the cost of the raw materials. But when you're still getting started, that's not really doable. So the question is, do you lose money or do you charge a little bit more in order to be profitable? Simone seems to be in between the middle there. So far in the middle that she states that she's pretty much losing money almost every single month right at the moment until the thing scales up and she's able to hit break even. 
Now, how could we help with this? Well, there's a number of ways we could help with this. This is actually the reason that Slant 3D was kind of started. With mass production 3D printing through print farms like ours, you don't have minimum order quantities unless you're ordering large batches. At that point, we do say you gotta order like 100 pieces, but 100 pieces is not a large volume. Or you can connect into like our print on demand applications like Etsy and Shopify, so that when an order comes in, it is printed and shipped out. That eliminates warehousing, that eliminates MLQs, and it eliminates all the fulfillment work that you would have to do if you ordered a batch of stuff and then had to ship it out the door. So all of those costs of running a business, all those fixed costs, if you're doing it yourself, become variable costs based on the amount of demand that you have. If no one buys your product, you are not gonna get billed to make that product. So you don't have to spend money in order to make money, you make the money and then you spend the money. This is really the joy of 3D printing in this regard. Now, of course, you have to deal with surges, and at that point, you would want to order a batch of 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever it happens to be. And at that scale, it would be cheaper than the print-on-demand option. But now the question becomes, can you design a clothes hanger the way Simone did with 3D printing? Now, this was a quick knockout where we were proving out the concept. This would need to be refined more, but it is a good starting point. So Simone's hanger, the key differentiator of it is the fact that it folds. And it folds with a steel rod so that you can put a shirt on it, fold it sideways, and then hang it up against the wall just like this. There's a number of challenges when doing this with 3D printing. First of all, is it tough enough? Well, generally people would say, ah, oh, 3D printing, you can't make a clothes hanger out of that. Yes, you absolutely can. The trick is to make sure that you're printing it flat on the build plate. Now, a few people who are regular viewers of the channel will know that our build plates will not print something this large, which means that you have to condense it. Now, you could either fold it over flat like this so that it's printed horizontally, which we actually did, but we really didn't like the look of it and having it print fully flat across here would have whatever is being folded into it be pinched and squeezed in a way that really wasn't useful and you'd end up having something kind of closed partially like that because you have t-shirt balled up inside of there. We'll talk about how we fix that a little bit more but I wanna focus on the bed a little bit. So we folded it flat, can't actually do that because of other reasons. So what we did was we put this arm straight up in the air in the design. Now, if you're printing straight up in the air, if you're doing it with a normal ring like this, now you did just make a cruddy part where somebody could knock this against the wall and since the layers are going this direction, they break off. But what we did in order to reinforce it is you have this side down against the bed, you don't have a rib inside of there in order to minimize material, and then on this side, you do put a rib up here, a very small, thin membrane that allows you to get the strength that you need. This is not gonna break off, and I can squeeze it and beat it and twist it, and it's not gonna wear out because there's a nice, strong shear plate right there to make sure that these side parts cannot bend so much that they break. So now we have it printing on a build plate in the size that is available by fitting inside of here and fitting a little bit diagonally. We know that the hook is fine because it's printed in the plane of the layer lines, that's okay. Now, the hinge itself, like I said, we can't hinge at the same point because it ends up creating a pinch down there where your thing gets in the way and then it only closes partially, which looks a little bit gross. So what we did was actually create a hinge where the hinge point is up a centimeter or so, so that it bends around that and now you have this nice parallel fold where they're side by side. We did put the center support inside of there. We're not necessarily sure if that's uh, necessary. We think we can probably redo the hinges on the ends so that they're more minimal and you use less material. Because even though this is filled up with fairly low infill, because all the strength of a 3D printed part is in the walls, this allows you to make sure that it's totally beefy and really has no compressibility right there. So we might be able to eliminate in production. If Simone, you wanna have us help you produce a new batch of hangers that are lower cost, we can do it for you. But ultimately, it was just a proof of concept with this first couple of designs. The other thing we added on here, since we're doing 3D printing and we could do whatever geometry we want, we added a few resistance bumps up here to make sure that your shirt doesn't slide off too darn easily while hanging here at this kind of odd angle. But overall, that solves all the functional necessities of what Simone was going for. Now, this yellow hanger is not one that Simone would wanna put onto her video. The Yetch store has a really nice aesthetic that is very hard wool woven guy with beard sort of a brand to where it's meant to be steel and wood and kind of premium materials. This doesn't look like premium materials. This looks like something you get at a dollar store. What we would do in order to address that is that it would be possible to print this either in a blacks or browns so that it has the correct aesthetic. We could change the geometry to make it look a little bit more rugged rather than plastic hanger. Or we could even go so far as actually printing it in wood itself to where you have a true wood feel and look to it. 
that is actually quite good and still strong enough. However, wood filled filaments are a little bit weaker, so some re-engineering might have to be done. So there's a way to change the cosmetics of a 3D printed part so it looks really good. And of course, we could texture the outside to give it a non-layer lined look, so you could get a really premium product out of this, especially if you were doing print on demand. Now, this is not a product that I would generally recommend for print on demand. You can do it, it's maybe not necessarily right, because with what Simone is wanting to do as far as margins and reduction in cost, printing a single one of these out of the blue might be too expensive. And since you wanna sell sets of them, because very few people want a single hanger, you might have to do a production batch. At that point, printing does allow you to produce fewer of these than with other processes, because you don't have a mold or you don't have a dye or anything else along those lines. You just buy the number of parts that you need at the cost that they they are. And with those larger quantities, you do get economies of scale to where the cost can be reduced more. So hopefully this is an idea that can help Simone solve the problems over there with the Yet store and help her to scale up and get a successful business going over there. She doesn't necessarily have to use 3D printing, but it is an option that is available that many people don't realize. Printing can produce at scale. If she has 10,000 orders tomorrow, those can all be printed and shipped within a couple of days. That's what we do. It is feasible right now. So, so long as she's able to design a product that can be printed, and we've given a few of the baselines of how to get that done, then she can eliminate the problems of the upfront costs, the long-term storage costs, and the R&D costs, because she can just order a new one every time or print them at home to figure out the prototypes and then make the final refinements to make sure it's good for our process and then just roll with it. So rather than creating one and a half products a year, she could be creating a one and a half products a week or maybe even a day, depending on how fast they wanna go which then also gives the benefit of iterating through lots of different options so her customers can find the stuff that they like, purchase that, and then she can focus in on that. It eliminates all this risk of having to swing for the fences and make sure that your product is right on the first try and instead makes it more iterative to where you can try what might work and then move on to something else or refine it over time. So we just wanted to talk about that. Simone, if you need any help or want any advice around this, we can absolutely help you out. And of course, this video, I, we didn't hide any secrets with how we designed this. So reach out if you want any assistance on that kind of stuff, happy to talk and see if we can help with the actual manufacturing itself. Hopefully the rest of you all learned something about design for mass production 3D printing and why it can be so important in a business. Other than that, have a great day, everybody.